We often hear about an October surprise that happens every presidential election where something unexpected occurs that affects the presidential race to varying degrees. For example, in early October of 2016, we learned about Trump's infamous Access Hollywood tape. And then in the same month later on, we learned that then FBI Director James Comey announced that he was reopening his investigation into Hillary Clinton for her use of a private email server. And it's debatable how much these scandals impacted the 2016 election, if at all. But when the race is as close as this one is, it's not unreasonable to worry about unexpected variables that could come into play and potentially change the outcome of the election for better or worse. So without further ado, I want to talk about potential things that could realistically happen that could impact November's election and potentially even change the outcome of the election. So some of these hypothetical scenarios are going to work in Kamala's favor and others will work Work in Trump's favor. So let me talk about some of them that come to mind. Number one, Biden steps down due to an unexpected medical emergency and Kamala Harris is then sworn in as 47th president ahead of the election. I think that this is unlikely at this point, but Joe Biden is 81 years old. And when you're in your 80s, your health can unexpectedly take a turn for a worse at any time for a number of reasons. I mean, we've all had loved ones who have gone through medical emergencies out of nowhere, right? And if Biden is no longer able to serve as president, Kamala would obviously become the president since she's now the VP. Now, in terms of who this would hurt or help, I actually think that it would help Kamala. She automatically gains the incumbent advantage and Americans might not necessarily want to kick her out of office before giving her a chance to really do anything. Now, there are some downsides to this. As president, she wouldn't be able to campaign as vigorously and it might blunt some of the momentum among people who really want to see the first female president elected because once it happens, I think that that initial excitement of seeing her win kind of goes away, right? So the enthusiasm kind of disperses in some ways possibly but then again those same people would be galvanized because if they were excited about the first woman president they'd be gutted if the first female president only served for two to three months it would be awful so overall i do think that this would help kamala harris even though there are some downsides she would be fully in charge biden would be completely out of the picture and she would be the one who can immediately set the agenda so there are a lot of benefits to that but let's get to number two an international incident occurs now i'm keeping this purposefully vague because there's a range of things that could happen. It's a very big planet. But I think that the most likely scenario is a war in the Middle East catalyzed by war criminal Benjamin Netanyahu. And I say this because Biden's Israel policy has been an unmitigated disaster. He is breaking both U.S. and international law by supplying them with weapons that they're using to commit war crimes in Gaza. And to make matters worse, Netanyahu obviously wants Donald Trump to win and was on Fox News in early September undermining Biden on national television. He was saying a ceasefire deal isn't actually imminent, and that's humiliating for Biden. But Biden's decision to embolden him again and again and again, coupled with his refusal to use leverage to cut off weapons to Israel, as previous presidents have done, by the way, that could all blow up in his face at any time in a massive way. Or more specifically, it could blow up in Kamala's face when we're talking about the election. Netanyahu has already invaded the West Bank, and it's not unreasonable to think that he'd launch a ground invasion with Lebanon or possibly a hot war with Iran. It's all within the realm of possibility. And if that happens, it would unquestionably pull the United States in, and it would be a disaster of epic proportions for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. And Trump could easily exploit that catastrophe for his own political gain. Netanyahu could help him exploit that catastrophe for his political gain. They would both almost certainly attack Biden for not doing enough to help Israel and not being strong enough. And he'd also blame Biden for starting the war in the first place, which would actually be true. And there's a number of ways that Trump could use Use that to his advantage with the help of Netanyahu. So this could easily blow up in his face, Biden's face. And the only way to prevent this from happening is to cut off the weapons to Israel so they don't have the capacity to expand the war in that way. But we know Biden isn't going to even consider doing that. So what's left? Well, the only way for Kamala Harris to save face if this happens is she's got to break with Biden before this scenario unfolds. 
Otherwise, the stink of his failed policy is going to rub off on her. Now, at this point in time, it's clear that she doesn't want to publicly break with Biden, which is a bad move in my opinion. But we're getting leaked stories in the Washington Post from her team about how she would consider conditioning aid to Israel and challenge them more directly. And this is intended to assuage concerns of people who care about the genocide in Gaza. But it's just not good enough. I'm sorry, it's not good enough. A public break from Biden is the only thing that can save her ass should Netanyahu make matters worse. So this is a ticking time bomb and Kamala would be wise to distance herself from Biden's failed policy here while she still can. Take that time bomb, throw it to Biden and let it blow up in his face. Distance yourself from him so you're not viewed as to blame if Netanyahu expands this war. If Kamala Harris does not do this and the worst case scenario does come to fruition, I think that it would unquestionably hurt her and help Donald Trump. But this brings us to number three, a big signature policy push from Kamala. Now, this isn't necessarily what we think of when October surprise comes to mind. Nevertheless, it is something that could have a meaningful impact on the election. Listen, it's obvious that enthusiasm for Kamala Harris has died down a bit after the DNC convention. They didn't let a single Palestinian American speak. Then to make matters worse, Kamala gave a disturbingly hawkish speech on foreign policy. And in her first interview as a presidential candidate, she sounded like a Republican on issues like fracking, immigration, foreign policy. And all of this has blunted her momentum. She had a lot of goodwill with the left simply because she's not Biden, but the honeymoon is over now. And that initial enthusiasm has tapered off and the polls are starting to even out. The surge, for the most part, seems to be over. And if she wants to regalvanize the Democratic Party's base, she needs to stop talking to Republicans and centrists for a minute and come back and try to court progressives again. And the way that she can do this is with a big policy proposal that would excite the base and increase turnout. Now, one way she can do this is by making it very, very clear that she will give the one thing to the base that they're asking for. She will break with Biden on Gaza. Even if she says as president, I'm simply going to make sure that international law is respected and she indirectly signals in some way publicly that she'll break with Biden on Gaza, I think she would immediately get a massive boost in states like Michigan. And the uncommitted voters there that she hasn't been able to win back would have a real reason to vote for her as opposed to a third party candidate. But I mean, if she doesn't do that, she needs a Bernie Sanders type proposal. I'm talking something big, free college, total student debt cancellation, even something like a public option or marijuana legalization would do wonders in terms of exciting the base. Look, she would never go for something like this, but if she came out with Medicare for All, something that she originally supported when she was running for president the first time, but then, you know, she got too much criticism and ran away from it. If she came out with Medicare for All and had Tim Walz help her explain it, I think she would crush in this election cycle. Because even though all this talk of abolishing private insurance might sound scary to Democrats, normal people don't like their private insurance. In fact, we fucking hate our private insurance. And so if you explain to us that we no longer have to worry about insurance companies gouging us and that healthcare will be free at the point of service, I don't think she understands how powerful that would be. That is part of the reason why Bernie Sanders had so much momentum around his campaigns two times and all the way until he dropped out. It's because this is something that we've been wanting. The Democratic Party's base has been wanting this for decades. So if she came out with something like that, it would do wonders. But I mean, that's just a recommendation. She's not going to do that. You can, you can, you know, scale it down. Just I'm going to cancel all student debt. I'm going to ask for a bill and I'm going to campaign on that. That would do wonders. But I think that the policies she's proposing now, to be fair to her, they're decent, and I'm glad that she's focusing on housing and the care economy, but I think that they're a little wonky for the average American. I think that she needs to go bigger. I think she needs to do something that is impactful yet simple. Just healthcare, public option, or Medicare for all, something along those lines, and it would put her over the edge, in my opinion, because right now, I think that she has killed the momentum by campaigning like a Republican. And Trump has also done the same because he's, you know, pivoting to the center when it comes to abortion. And there's some pro-lifers or not pro-lifers, forced birthers to be clear, because they're not pro-life, they're pro-forced birth. But Trumpers are pissed off. But the problem is that when it comes to the Democratic Party, they win elections when their base turns out, when their base is excited. So she needs to excite the base, get people to get off their asses and vote. And she doesn't do that by pandering to centrists. She does that with a big policy that would change our lives. But 
Let's get to number four, sudden economic anxiety due to a type of economic crash or change with a particular market or industry that abruptly threatens the livelihood of working Americans. If this were to happen, it would hurt Kamala Harris because Biden is the incumbent and incumbents always get blamed for economic problems. Although I think that if Kamala messages in a way that paints Trump as the incumbent, as she's been doing, she could mitigate some of the damage here. And I think that she's done a good job campaigning as if she's the challenger and Trump is the incumbent. And it doesn't seem like the Republican Party's attempts to tie Kamala to economic failures they're blaming on Biden is sticking. I mean, so far, I think she's done a good job at taking credit for the good and distancing herself from the bad when it comes to what Biden has been able to do or what he's being blamed for. But should something like this happen, messaging is going to be key here for Kamala Harris, but it's also going to be key for Trump. Although I will say Kamala is at a disadvantage because Republicans always have an advantage on the economy, according to voters, for some reason. I don't get it, but they always trust Republicans on the economy more than they trust Democrats. So there's a good chance that Trump would benefit from this. But Let's get to number five, third party candidates consolidate. So we saw Trump get a bigger bump after RFK Jr. dropped out and endorsed him because he was pulling more votes away from Trump than he was from Kamala. Now, when it comes to third parties, you're always going to have third party voters that reliably vote third party no matter what. And they would likely just stay home if there wasn't a third party on the ballot. But if you assume that some third party voters would actually vote Republican or Democrat if the third party option wasn't available, we tend to see libertarians pull more from Republicans, around 3%, than the Green Party who pulls like 1% away from Democrats, if you take the logic that they are pulling votes from Democrats. I think it's true to a certain extent, but overstated usually. So it's usually overall a greater net loss for Republicans when it comes to third parties. This election, though, is different. Now we have a libertarian candidate in Chase Oliver, who's only polling at around 1%, and we have two left-wing candidates in Jill Stein and Cornell West polling at 1% and about 0.6% respectively. So this time, it's a net loss for Democrats, which means Kamala has a bigger deficit to make up in swing states than Biden did in 2020. But here's what could change. The left-wing candidates end up consolidating in some way. Say Cornell West hypothetically dropped out and endorsed Jill Stein, or he endorsed Kamala Harris. This could balance out the spoiler effect and effectively cancel it out altogether. Cornell West did say that Kamala's campaign offered him a position in her administration if he dropped out and endorsed her. Now, if he took himself out of the equation... The small portion of his votes would likely shift to Jill Stein, but some would also shift to Harris, and some of them would probably stay home, but it's something that could change the race, especially where it's really close in a state like Michigan. But another hypothetical change is that Chase Oliver starts to pull better and gets his numbers up to where Joe Jorgensen or Gary Johnson was in 2016 and 2020, that would bring the third party situation back to homeostasis and he would theoretically pull more votes away from Donald Trump than both Stein and West if he stays in the race. Or let's say a miracle happens and Biden is visited by an angel and he finally is convinced to cut off the weapons to Israel and actually does force Netanyahu to accept the ceasefire. Not gonna happen, but just hear me out. If that happens or if... Harris chose to call for an arms embargo, then all of a sudden, a lot of the third party voters in swing states might rethink their protest votes because a lot of them are voting third party specifically because they're dissatisfied with the Democratic Party's position here, particularly Arab Americans in states like Michigan, right? So if Biden or Harris undercut the appeal of third parties by adopting one of the policy appeals uh, that is being made to these voters in these swing states by third parties, it would make a huge difference where it matters. So the third party situation could change. Don't know if it's going to, but it could change and that would affect the race. Number six, a Supreme Court justice dies. This would immediately regalvanize the Democratic Party's base. I think that the same would happen on the Republican side, albeit to a lesser extent. Worst case scenario, their supermajority for Republicans is just a simple majority, right? They can still live with that. But defending a potential loss if a liberal dies or gaining a seat if a conservative dies would absolutely get a lot of people off their asses to vote Democrat. In previous elections, I don't know that something like this would have as big of an impact. Scalia died in 2016, and I think it had a minimal effect on the overall election. But Americans are now hyper aware of everything that the Supreme Court is doing, from corruption to overturning Roe v. Wade, 
Americans have a re renewed sense of the importance of the Supreme Court. So if an opening on the Supreme Court suddenly becomes available, that would likely be filled by the next president. I think that this would disproportionately benefit Kamala Harris because more Democrats would care about this than Republicans. So number seven, a new Trump scandal drops. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're probably rolling your eyes because there's nothing he can really do to turn off his base. But I'm not talking about a scandal that changes their minds. I'm talking about a scandal that loses him votes in battleground states where the margins are really thin with normies and swing voters. Now, I'm talking about something really nasty, not the typical Trump scandal of him saying something authoritarian and stupid, even though that is a big scandal. I'm talking about something bad like him using a slur or threatening to use nuclear weapons or assassinate Democrats when he's in power. Something very, very big out of the norm for Donald Trump. Something like that could have an impact. And even if it's a small impact, it could hurt him. The problem is that every time he opens his mouth, it's a fucking scandal. So the bar for what qualifies as a Trump scandal in 2024 is very high. The man is a felon and a rapist, and not to mention literally tried to illegally overturn the last election and incited an insurrection to do just that. So a lot of people, I think, are desensitized to his shenanigans at this point. But with that being said, it's plausible that some new scandal raises some eyebrows, right? We don't know. It's possible. Normies are very fickle. So if a swing voter is leaning to Trump because of the economy and something new is at the top of their mind before they pull the lever, that could change things. The same is true for Kamala Harris as well. Some scandal involving Kamala Harris could be big. Now, I think that the problem is that the bar for what is considered a scandal for Kamala is much lower compared to Donald Trump, right? Because I think that even if it's minimal, like she lied in the past or whatever, which is bad, but I mean, if she lied, Republicans would take that and they blow it up. Whereas they can't really do that for Donald Trump because if everything is a scandal, nothing is a scandal. So there's a problem there. It's a little bit lopsided in terms of what qualifies as a scandal. But nonetheless, if a new Trump scandal does pop up, I think that it could change things. And obviously the same is true for Kamala or Tim Walls. Now, last but not least, let's get to number eight. This one is dark, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't think this was within the realm of possibility. Okay. If Kamala wins, Trump's cronies in swing states, they could try to delay the certification until January 5th. And let's say Georgia's electoral votes in this scenario aren't included in the final count. And that was the one state that made the difference. And that was enough to sway the election to Trump. Even if she wins, she could lose. Perhaps one state submits fake electors and a Trump judge accepts them in court as legitimate and Congress is forced to certify them for some reason. Something like that. I'm catastrophizing a bit here, but Trump coup is number eight. Now, a lot would have to go wrong to get to the point where the election is actually stolen. He will try to steal it, but a lot must go wrong for Trump to successfully steal the election. But they tried it once, they're going to try it again, and I think it's something that we should be prepared for. Remember, Trump is an authoritarian, and we can't put anything past this man. And I have a video about this that I put out earlier in the week where we talk about what average citizens can do in the event this horrifying scenario becomes a reality. But it's one thing that I think we need to keep on our minds. We shouldn't go full doomer mode because of it, but we shouldn't bury our heads in the sand, right? Because anything can happen. So that is an event that can change the outcome of the election, theoretically speaking. Now, that's just eight scenarios. So there's a lot that can happen in a world with infinite possibilities in American politics in 2024. Crazier shit has happened. And so I think all of these things are within the realm of possibility. Now, my point in making this video is to emphasize that you should never get too comfortable depending on where we're at. If you look at polls and Kamala is doing good or Trump's doing bad, never just expect that that is going to definitely be the outcome because a lot can change and things change fast when it comes to elections that are this close. Look, it's American politics and anything can happen. And I think that the takeaway that I want you to have is that you need to absolutely exercise your right to vote to help bring about the outcome that's best for the country, which would be obviously defeating Donald Trump. Voting is just a small tool that we have to affect change. It's not the end all be all. And the real work begins after the election. And I say this because regardless if Kamala or Trump wins, we're going to have to constantly exert pressure on them to do what we want. Although to me, Kamala is the adversary that I would rather have in the White House. But 
That's eight things. Let me know if there's something that I didn't think about that you think is within the realm of possibility that we should look out for. I'm gonna come. Do not come. 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 Welcome to the come zone. Come. Come. Come.